And as always, joining us this week, John Wertheim. John, we will get straight into it. What is the hot goss? Let's spill some tea. What's happening with the Saudis? Tours combining, formal offers. I'm hearing a lot of chatter. What's the current state of events? Oh, man. I feel like I need to check my phone like uh, Adam Schefter because this is a, uh, yeah, yeah. a a developing story. Uh, no, I mean, yep. in, in a way, it's it's exciting. I mean, I, I do think one thing we can be pretty sure of, tennis will look a lot different uh, starting in about 2026. The question is how. We've had these disruptive forces that have been bubbling. Some of this is the, the Saudi interest that we've talked about. Some of this is just something like the Netflix slam. Um, clearly... There's a lot of sort of people taking an eye at tennis and saying, look, this system is suboptimal. Let's make this work. So I think this started with the Saudi interest. It came out probably last summer around Wimbledon. Andrea Godenzi is meeting with the Saudis and Craig Tiley gets wind of this and says, wait a second. If we have Saudi Arabia getting into this, if they take an event early in January, that will really hurt Tennis Australia, the, the calendar. What are we going to do about this? So Craig Tiley sort of makes this end run around the tour and tries to come up. We were calling it the Super Tour. Now it's the Premier Tour. This was going to be four majors. They were all going to get together, which is is rare. They were going to add 10 events. So the nine big events, add a 10th. Uh, presumably, that would go to Saudi Arabia to appease them, add something else. You know, you'd have, uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've it's actually interesting. They've, they've refined this. So it's including those 14 events. There's a eight weeks off guaranteed. That's significant. This would only be open to, uh, these would be 96 draw 10 day events uh, apart from the majors, but this would only be open to like the top 100. So what happens to all those other events? Well, who knows, but maybe every now and then you could play down, but basically this is uh, it's like getting a tour car because it's only the top 100. Um, and then Andrea Godenzi comes around and he is sort of working a separate path and he has done something very clever, which is basically he's he's gotten the Saudi money in hand. And but before we go further, I'm I'm just curious. I'm really quite impressed by him. Uh, I think everybody's sort of a former player, Italian Davis Cup, but this guy is really a capable, seasoned executive. This guy is a real poker player. Uh, I will tell you what he did this weekend at Indian Wells in a second. But I, I'm just curious. Did you have a sense? You played him once, beat him on clay. Good job. Did did you have a sense that? Uh, this was a really shrewd future executive. Well, if we're being fair, I don't respect anyone who lost to me on clay. <laughs> just so, just just so we're clear. Um, so I don't know. I don't know Godenzi that well. Um, we barely crossed over uh, in our playing lives. We played one time in Rome, um, but I, I do know a little bit about his his kind of post tennis career. This isn't someone who stayed in tennis, was around tennis somehow begged, barred, and dealt his way into the CEO position. He was a chief revenue officer at something called Music's Match, which is like a Spotify knockoff type situation. And I'll get parts of it wrong, so stay off the Twitter fingers. Uh, Co-founder of Soldo, which is simplified spending management. So two very different things, both outside uh, of tennis. So this isn't someone who is best attribute as a CEO is his forehand, right? It seems like he is qualified for this role. So basically the point made, don't undersell him uh, because of he's one of us former player dummies. Well put. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and you see him speak and you see some of these PowerPoint decks he puts together. This is a really, really savvy executive. So, you know, nothing's happened for a while. We've been hearing murmurs. You and I talked about, hey, the Saudis, they haven't done the live golf thing, but they've gotten the next gen and they've gotten in on this rankings deal that we talked about. And they're clearly making inroads in tennis. Um, there's a big meeting Saturday in Indian Wells. Uh, Craig Tiley is not there, but this is the premier tour, right? These are the four majors and the 10 events and everyone outside the top 100. Uh, it, it could be rough. And they give a very impressive presentation. Um, you know, these are based on Boston Consulting Group numbers, but they promise big revenue for the players. I was told no player in the top 100 would ever turn this down. Tours seem to like it. Players get eight weeks off. You have these big mixed events. This thing's got some nice momentum. Lou Shear, who uh, is CEO of, of the USTA, has sort of taken the reins. And Jane uh, Woodlicka, whose name I probably mispronounced, from Australia, from Tennis Australia, though she is from Wichita, Kansas, I'll have you know. Uh, she's kind of in the chairman role. They give this very, you know, I, I heard it was a, you know, pretty impressive presentation. Not a lot of specifics, but clearly this bid's looking pretty good. People are saying, yeah, I could, I could go with that. This will really streamline tennis. And all of a sudden, two days later, Godenzi comes and he's got his competing plan. 
And he says, I've got something that they don't, which is guaranteed billion dollar plus from the Saudis. Uh, it is not quite the three billion as has been reported, I'm told, but it is north of one. And given the state of the tours and given what a billion dollars means and given that this is not a live golf disruption, this is something clearly much more benign. Um, it also makes allotment for a 10th Masters event. Uh, the, the premier tours would be on grass clearly before Wimbledon. Um, I don't know where you hold it necessarily. Not that many venues in the UK that can hold a, uh, you know, a, a grass court event with 96 straws men and women. But um, so, I mean, it's not a dissimilar, it's not a dissimilar proposal. The only difference is that Godenzi has the billion plus dollars in the bag. And he um, was, was played a very nice game of poker. It didn't reveal that a lot of people were very surprised to hear that. So as we are speaking right now, you have these two competing offers. Um, you know, what, one of them is based on projections and the, the four majors will get together and they'll create a million dollar bonus for the players. It's all very nice. The other one has real, real money. It also has the complications that come with uh, Saudi Arabia and allegations of sports washing. Um, it's just, you know, I mean, the, the bottom line is I think tennis probably will end up in a better place provided everybody plays nice. But it's in some ways tennis being tennis that you've got everybody wants the bag. I, I said this was like the NIL of uh, this is like tennis's version of the NIL. Everybody wants this new revenue source and everybody suddenly, uh, looking over their shoulder and looking forward at the same time. Uh, but you have these two competing plans, and it's going to be very interesting to see who lands the plane. Um, you know, it's uh, the this premier tour, the super tour, it's got a lot to like. It's got a joint end-of-the-year final. Um, again, the eight weeks guaranteed off time, that's something that, that would appeal to a lot of players. But we've talked about this before on this podcast. Uh, money's got a pretty good track record. And I suspect uh, highest bidder wins. Yeah, and it, there's a feeling of inevitability, right? Which is a which is a huge motivator. You can stand aside, and something else will happen, and you might get left out in the cold. Now, with how much can Godenzi get done if he's working kind of around this slam group, right? Around the people that may. How much can he get done in the world of tennis without buy-in from the majors? It's a great question. I'm not sure he doesn't necessarily have that. I mean, again, I think there is a uh, li live golf is sort of the, in some ways it's a stalking horse, but it's also kind of this, this phantom uh, that everybody's afraid that this is going to completely blow things up. So one thing Godenzi had to do was first of all, say to the Saudis, look, let's work together. Please don't have a competing tour. This will work better for us if we all make nice. And now exactly. He's got to go to, Craig Tiley, chief among them, but he's got to go to these people who are now his rivals and say, listen, this doesn't undercut your event at all. This is just a way for more players to make more money. So he's going to have to do some political maneuvering, even if he has sort of the successful pathway. But it's really interesting. And, you know, at, at some level, it takes away from the attention on them. This is really existential for tennis, right? I mean, we're all we all love Yannick Sinner and we're all interested in these Indian Wells matches. But this is really you have a feeling this is going to be a big week when they write the history of tennis. And, and, and how, I mean, I, I got to think it wouldn't be hard if you're like, if I'm the slams, right. And this all comes from a place of, I'm not having these kind of side hallway meetings. So I, again, I, I probably speaking from a place of ignorance, but if I'm the slams and I go to the Saudi tours, be like, okay, you can, you can do all of the things that you're doing with Godenzi. We can get the tours to merge. Those are not the most valuable properties right that's a logistical issue that is you know most of the biggest uh, most of the big events are already together now washington is together it, it's not we don't have to reinvent the wheel to figure out how to coexist with two different tours at the same venue over the course of two weeks if you're the slams you're going okay yeah take that offer and then add the majors and tell me why we're not going to win this bid yeah ex exactly um i mean i guess the, the one thing that is just hovering over all this is Godenzi clearly has this Saudi money that he has now revealed. Um, this premier tour, which again, it sounds great. Mixed events, mixed finals, time off. Um, everybody goes home happy. There's there's a grass court, 10th Masters. That doesn't sound so bad. Everyone's going to be in England anyway. I mean, yeah. a lot of it sounds set, but it's just, is one group going to pay you X dollars more? Um, so no, I, I think... Whichever of these models 
you know, I mean, you can sort of ask these hypothetical questions, right? I mean, clearly this premier tour is only open to like the top hundred players. So are we suddenly saying Delray, Dallas, pick your event on the calendar that isn't in this group. They're not going to get a top hundred player or the player who's 101st has no chance of playing these big events. It, it's all going to be really interesting to see sort of who makes what compromises. Yeah. I mean, listen, you can't have like by that, if that would have happened in 2011, what I see, what I, you, there has to be a, a cycle in cycle out situation. Basically what you're doing is you're creating another opportunity for someone to, uh, run a minor league tour de facto, but on like a 250 level, right? Because that's kind of the only tour event that you're going to get straight into if you're ranked around 100 anyways, right? You're not going to get in, I guess, a 96 draw with Master Series. You can kind of sneak in. But it's not as if someone who's 150 in the world is playing ATP tour events week after week. Like, it, it doesn't actually shift. It sounds like more alarming than I think it actually works in reality. 104 direct entries into Grand Slams. Right, you're having to solve for like four, right? And so let's like, okay, we have 110 people that can play on this tour. Like, it just seems like Godenzi is. I think he's smart because he's basically saying we have, uh, we have these two tours to merge. I have agreement with the WTA tour, but I still think if the majors are unified, I don't see how they don't go to the Saudis and say, listen, if you have a billion dollars and it's a simple merge, which is basically logistics and geography. Right, and then figuring out what to do with the minor league system. How are we not worth three billion with the majors? And uh, it doesn't even have to be the Saudis, right? I mean, there's, there's private equity. You could go to the Qataris, sure. who yeah. have a competition with the Saudis. I mean, there are a lot of angles. I mean, I also think, like, you know, everybody sort of tennis is so screwed up, and tennis. I mean, I think big picture, sp spend some time in media as you have been lately. Not a growth industry these days. Um, when you are talking about any sector in which people want investment and the question is just how to deploy it and people want to invest in the product and they see uh, something that could be optimized for more growth and more revenue, uh, big, big picture, I do think this is ultimately good for tennis. It's going to come with the usual infighting. It's going to come with the usual horse trading. They're going to be the usual sort of what about the women? Are they getting screwed? I think there are a lot of factions and a lot of considerations, but I do think like, big picture, the fact that we have this sort of interest in this global sport is ultimately a, a good thing that we shouldn't lose sight of. Yeah, I agree. And listen, everyone's playing their leverage point right now. If, if, if Godenzi's in the room and that's he's got an offer in hand, adding the slams is only going to benefit. Like if he actually has that and he has consensus amongst, amongst tours that he can actually you know pull the trigger on this and it's a viable thing, then that's the leverage point against the slams, and the slams obviously have their own leverage point. It seems like everyone is going to end up uh, included. Now, the big question for me is who runs the minor league system? And then the minor league system goes from futures, challengers, and it seems like they would eventually take over the 250s. Is I would actually like to see it where you have a bunch of them in isolated geographical spaces, so you're not having to put the cost for someone who's 150 in the world to travel around to Delray and then the next flying to Africa and then the next, like, maybe there's like a club tennis model in Europe where that goes for three months and then you go over to the States and you knock out eight or 10 weeks straight of a 250 level event and you have, you know, allow for 20 spots to cross over kind of like a tour card, right? There's top 125 and then you kind of have to play your way in. So uh, I can see a way out of this. Um, it seems like the money is there. Um, it feels like there's inevitability. So I think a move has to be made because if it's not, then someone's left in the dark. And I think it actually ends up more fractured than it would be, um, you know, if you kind of were just firmly against uh, anything. Um, but it, but it's interesting. Obviously, an ongoing story. It seems like it's gaining momentum. It, it, I, I like this part of it because it seems like people are moving uh, their chess pieces around, their leverage pieces around. Uh, we will see what happens. It feels like it's going to happen at some point. And it's going to be a monumental uh, change for the tours. But, you know, listen, we, we hope for the best as, as tennis fans. And uh, JW, thanks, man, for, uh, for keeping us up to date like you always do. You got it.